Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Charlie Fleet, and welcome to the fourth and final meeting of our Solid Waste Resource Management Plan Advisory Committee meeting. Quite a mouthful. So glad to see uh, a quorum here today. We've got an exciting meeting, but before I get into it, I'm going to ask Creston to come up and give us some important information. Thank you, Charlie. Again, welcome everybody, and thanks again for all your time and efforts that you've put forward uh, through this process, through this group and committee. Uh, and as Charlie said, here at our last scheduled meeting to help us uh, shape our plan as we go forward. Uh, so I'm gonna cover some updates. It's actually been a busy few weeks. We were just together about a month ago and uh, got actually a few things here to fill you in on that have been happening out of the direct uh, sphere of the plan, but uh, do affect what we're here to talk about. So just wanna pass those things on. Um, first. As a follow-up to our advisory committee meeting uh, at the end of April, the team, Christina, Charlie, and I, Molly, went to the Environmental Commission the next Thursday, a couple days afterwards. We updated uh, the commission as a body on the progress on our project. We presented to them the options that you folks uh, reviewed, weighed in on, gave feedback, and we shared that feedback with the commission so that they could uh, see where you folks were, were uh, feeling on those. And we also gave them the status of the project overall but gave particular updates and uh, points around the cost of service analysis that uh, we looked at at our second meeting and the resident survey results. And then following our presentation and discussion with the commission, the commission uh, itself uh, was presented and passed a resolution, uh, again recommending that the city become a constituent, a founding member of the WARMA uh, authority, the new regional authority that's forming. So the city, as you remember, we haven't made that determination. City Council tabled that uh, item in March, and so the Commission's uh, encouraging Council to bring that back up. And both Council members from the Commission were there at the meeting and heard that discussion and, and that vote. And it to be considered on June 3rd. Okay, yep, that's unofficial as far as I know. That's what I, scuttlebutt I've heard, but that's uh, from the Commissioner. And then uh, also, I would, just to add to that too, uh, some of you may have been at the Michigan Recycling Coalition uh, annual conference last week, and uh, at the opening of the, the conference, the mayor even uh, voiced his support and publicly gave comments, uh, hoping that uh, the city would decide to join that. So just wanted to make sure that got passed along to everybody. Uh, another item that the groups uh, touched on and, and looked at in terms of options, uh, including the student uh, move-in, move-out season and how materials management uh, is handled there. Just wanted to, again, pass along an update uh, in case some of you may have heard uh, how things uh, went uh, a couple weeks ago when, when that occurred. And knowing that you're weighing in, you're helping to shape and guide that program and those efforts going forward. But again, just in case some of you may have heard and to clarify that uh, for this recent uh, go-round, uh, the city did expand the program and provided four days of additional dumpster tips to the multifamily sites uh, at no charge to the properties in addition to the typical drop-off location. So if you hear that, that, that did happen that's outside of this process and you folks are definitely weighing in and guiding that, that area going forward and recommendations of the plan related to that. Yet another area and something been keeping you uh, abreast of that uh, the contracts that we have in place with Waste Management of Michigan for our commercial franchise collection of commercial uh, waste and two contracts with Recycle Ann Arbor, one for recycling collections and two for processing of recyclables. Uh, this group weighed in right at the beginning that those uh, contracts should get extended so that this process could go forward uh, and come to uh, recommendations. And so we're at the point that those amendments to extend those contracts are slated to also be on the June 3rd uh, council meeting. So if you're into council and solid waste as two things, June 3rd, watch it on CTN or show up at council chambers. Uh, so those will be going on there. And then uh, also an item back to our last meeting. A uh, question was asked early on, uh, Tom and Richard asked it, I responded in terms of the status of Recycle Ann Arbor and a proposal to the city in terms of reactivating the MRF. There is an update on that as well, that following the meeting uh, that we held, uh, Recycle Ann Arbor did provide the city with an updated uh, submittal, uh, a sole source proposal 
uh, unsolicited being the official term that wasn't something we have got out for RFPs, but they did submit it to us for our consideration. And uh, in examining what the city can do with that, uh, been determined uh, by our legal staff that in order for the uh, city to act on that and to clearly just take out any ambiguity, uh, recommended that some tweaks to our city code uh, be put into place to make it very clear and transparent that the city administrator has authority to make a determination that certain uh, work can be sole sourced, would not have to go out through competitive bidding. And so uh, the my understanding is that draft uh, ordinance language is getting put together and would be going through city council for a code amendment, code revision. So that's a process that takes two readings at city council, a public hearing. So there's a couple of steps along the way, but that's a, a first uh, key step to then enable uh, the city to put something to city council to decide if they wanted to enter into a contract uh, based on that submittal. And so uh, the non-legal staff, uh, technical staff, public services, are continuing to review and evaluate that submittal and uh, intend to uh, keep going forward uh, to try to shape that into a contract uh, scope that can be presented to council, uh, anticipating that council would make those code changes. It's not just for this particular submittal, it would be for uh, all submittals such as that, but this is the catalyst uh, for that change. And then a last item that actually kind of scanning the room, I don't see Theo yet, because I was going to pay, oh, he isn't back, all right, so I'll, I'll peg him, kind of throw him under the bus as a source for this. But he asked me to pass along to everybody something uh, he picked up and received from the uh, Ann Arbor Summer Festival. And he passed along a, a very concise, uh, clear message, I'll just read from it real quick, that uh, in 2018, the Ann Arbor Summer Festival made a commitment to become a zero waste event over the next two to three years. Implementing new three-stream waste stations will require guidance from human beings like you. They need volunteers to guide festival goers when tossing out their compost, recycling, and landfill items. And individuals and teams are welcome to sign up. So I've got a link uh, to that. Uh, I'm going to ask Charlie to include it in the meeting summary. So those links will be there, and there's a couple there uh, to go ahead and sign up and also to pass on information that the message continued to would love people like us, this committee for sure, to be amplifiers, to spread word about this opportunity. Uh, so asking people to share this uh, opportunity via Facebook, Nextdoor, Twitter, et cetera. And also for information, if you want to go out and check on it or just to also pass along, uh, it was a topic of a recent edition of WEMU's Issues of the Environment. So uh, the links to that uh, uh, segment on their broadcast, we'll share that out too in the, in the same meeting summary. So. As I said, lots of things been going on, area of solid waste, even between our last meeting and here. So with that, I'll turn it over to Charlie to move us through the meeting. Okay, thank you. Hopefully you've all received an agenda and that you've signed in. We really appreciate that. We're gonna hear first from me. I'm going to talk a little bit about what we did last time and the contributions that you made to the process. And then we're going to move into a presentation of the material that you received. And you basically received two sections. One is relatively new, uh, baseline assumptions, service options, funding options. We haven't talked about that before. We're going to spend a little time on it. And then we're going to get back to the options now, recommendations that we worked on last time. Crescent's going to talk about the next steps to finalize the solid waste plan and then we have something called process feedback. One of the things the city prides itself on is public engagement and improving public engagement. So we've created a survey and we'd like you to fill that out before you leave. That would be very helpful. So back to last time, uh, you might remember those of you that participated, and I see a lot of familiar faces here, we went over a whole set of options and we asked you in small groups that were facilitated by some of us sitting around the room, uh, what options knocked your socks off and why, which turned you off and why, and questions on any of them. We did that for residential, commercial, and then on the alley options, you might remember we had four, and we asked you to pick the two that you thought were best. When we went to the Environmental Commission a couple days later, here's what we told them. On residential sector, uh, we felt there was strong support for 
year-round residential compost collection. Uh, as far as curbside textile collection, generally supported. Bulk e-waste, mixed support, e-waste, mixed support. So what we're talking about here is almost all the groups, seven of them, and almost all the people in the groups said, yeah, we want to do this. This was a majority, maybe half, maybe half. Okay? So that's what we heard on residential. On commercial, fog management generally supported commercial organics collection. Strong support, particularly if it was targeted to the high-end producers. Student move-in and move-out collection. Limited support. That means that less than 50% thought that that was a good idea. And by the way, we're talking about collecting notes from seven different facilitators, parsing through them, emailing them, trying to determine uh, where the feedback stood. On, this is the construction and demolition waste, correct? Generally supported with need for more data before setting policy. Commercial services participation enforcement, strong support. There was a question about the high cost. And then downtown alley, uh, we had four alternatives. And the ones that received the most support were seven-day collection, mandatory Saturday and Sunday for restaurants and bars, consolidated containers and seven-day collection with special assessment. Both of those were strong support. Uh, nearly everybody opposed the bag-based collection with twice daily pickup. And the consolidated underground containers also received less than majority support. So that's where we ended last time. And in our final meeting, what we're going to ask you is sort of your, your, your current state of input that you have based on where we were last time. So one of the things that I want to lead off in, in my role as the public engagement facilitator is this question of strategy. So here's a definition way out of Webster, plan of action designed to achieve overall or major aim. So what this solid waste plan is, it's a five-year strategy, right, Christina? So you've been contracted to deliver a five-year strategy, and that generally fits in the famous strategic planning. We're talking about something relatively long-term. So one of my favorite examples when I do strategic planning is to ask people, what was Bill Clinton's strategy in 1992 in the campaign? What was the strategic thrust of the campaign? Anybody remember that? Economy. It's the economy, stupid, right? So, when anyone asked a question about one of its girlfriends, he went to, it's the economy, stupid. Nice, nice move. If we go back to World War II, there were two primary strategies. What were those? Anyone remember them in your history? Well, one was total mobilization. And my parents were mobilized in the farms that they grew up in and lived in at that time. They were collecting rubber, collecting metal, there was total mobilization. They were buying little stamps, and I remember as a kid, they were showing me their books that they made up. And the other one was fight a two-front war. There were a lot of arguments about whether a two-front war was even possible to fight. And yet, the United States pulled it off and obviously won. So those were strategic policies that helped achieve the, the victory. Now, if you look at all this material, I know some of it's pretty dense, and one of my jobs is to cut through the gobbledygook. The two strategies that you're seeing here in all these options, recommendations, one is service enhancement. So there's an increase in services, service expansion. That's strategy number one. And that is apparent in the residential and commercial recommendations. The other strategy is service improvement. And most of that, right, Christine, is focused in the downtown. So as you move through this material, think about those strategies. One, service expansion to service improvement. That's what this is targeted at. And you might think, hey, how did these people come up with it? Well, they came up with it in talking to you, conducting these meetings. It could have been service contraction. We could have received overwhelming feedback. We're doing too much. It's costing too much. Start cutting now. Cut our rates now. I've done a lot of rate strategic planning. We didn't hear that. Now, you may decide today, now that it's your, your chance, flip the switch, <laughs> let's start cutting services. We're already getting more than we need. But we didn't hear that, and it was pretty, pretty strong consensus, right, Christina? So I would ask you today, when you're looking at these options and the other material that Christina is going to be giving you, to think in terms of commenting on the strategy. 
Now we are going to ask you what you think in terms of priorities, and that's important. So we're going to be handing out a forced ranking tool at the end of the presentation that will give you a chance to tell us this is what we think you should do first. Because those in the downtown might think, get the alleys fixed first. Okay? Get that done before you worry about year-round compost collection, organic collection. How many would say that right now? Fix the alleys first. Two, three. How many would say start composting first? Okay. Well, right now we have more people here that think that that's a, a more important tactic, okay, in the strategy that we're constructing. So, any questions on that or comments? So, service expansion, service improvement. Tom. Right. Well, you've raised something that's very helpful, okay, which is an answer to this, what is our aim? What is our aim here? All right? And what we learned in the beginning of the process, well, a lot of feedback we received on zero waste. What are you doing for zero waste? We also heard, what are you doing for diversion? That was another important concept that we heard. And then the other concept was, what are you doing to improve our service now in the downtown and make it more accessible and make it cleaner and make, our, make, make the alley something we'd be proud of? Okay, we did a business folk, downtown focus group that was very clear. We also heard a lot of feedback about service improvement. So, Tom, the aims are relatively diverse, okay? The, the zero waste and the diversion policy that supports or the diversion goals that support it we are attempting in the recommendations to respond to that, okay? But we're also attempting to respond to the needs of other people that had other goals that they wanted to achieve. Is that correct, Christina? Yeah, and I think I'll answer that. I think it's a great time for you to come up before I say stuff that uh, is not really correct, okay? Thank you. Um, what I would add to that is when we were contracted for this project, it was to develop a strategy that is for the next five years for the uh, solid waste services of the city to be provided in a sustainable fashion. And one of the things that we immediately found by doing the cost of service is that the uh, sustainability element on the financial side isn't there currently for what the city currently performs. So there are changes that can be made and we have identified some of those in the recommendations we'll go through today that will help to improve that financial condition and then the decisions that get made for the next five years for uh, any new programs or enhancements to programs have to be also taken into consideration of where does that additional funding come from. So while more diversion is great and we do have options and recommendations that will um, have substantial impact on uh, increasing diversion, that wasn't the sole focus. And I see Crescent wants to say something. I can't answer okay. that. Uh, clarification, when you use the word sustainability just now, I'm sorry, um, clarification, when you use the word sustainability just now, I think you're talking about financial sustainability, right, as opposed to environmental sustainability. Yeah, uh, more so on the financial side, but okay. sustainability as a whole. So um, when the city looks at sustainability, obviously they're looking at other things related to climate impact and. Okay, uh, I hope yeah, I hope that 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 is an important piece. And I think there were a number of us who sent a letter saying, right. you know, that that should be a really important piece. And uh, that is obviously a big portion of it. Um, but again, it was something that we set up to be uh, framed as a strategic plan, as a business plan. Um, that also then ties back to the funding element that we can't do any of the programs that we have without appropriate funding in place and we don't know how much funding to allocate or to secure if we don't know what the structural changes are that we're making to the system. Um, frankly, five years is a, a relatively short period to make changes, so a plan that would look to uh, more visionary aspects that ties to a zero waste strategy and a zero waste vision would be looking to a longer time frame um, and setting up some near-term goals uh, as well as some longer-term options. And so I think I understand where you're going with this. Um, you know, you know, in 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 Michigan, there's a very specific statutory meaning for a, for a solid waste plan. And some of us in the room who've been part of 
um, solid waste planning processes in the past are you know are familiar with that and it you know and it, it includes down to the county level and includes everything that uh, that 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 jurisdiction is planning to have done or allow to get done in the solid waste sphere um, for the next period of time. It, it seems like this is not that. And I, I raise this because I think it's an important distinction to understand. So for, for instance, a lot of people, myself included, have raised issues about one important thing or another. The one I've raised, I think, at every single meeting is what about the recycling drop-off station? Used by tens of thousands of people every, every, every year, it's in need of attention in different ways. Um, it, you know, it hasn't been on the priority list, and if this is a solid waste plan like those county solid waste plans, I'd have a real problem with that. If this is a solid waste plan, um, if this is a solid waste plan that's just looking at a few priorities that it wants to emphasize, but maybe some other things can also be addressed even if they're not on the priority list, uh, then I'm a little more comfortable with the approach that we're taking. But what are we doing? And to respond to that, so this is not at all tied to the um, requirements under Michigan law for counties to do solid waste planning. One of the drivers on this um, plan is to uh, be consistent with the Washtenaw County solid waste plan and the uh, vision that it set out in its uh, last update. But those plans are much more focused um, to the disposal, um, driving diversion to a certain point, but the city really has the disposal side of its services locked up. It's got a long-term contract in place for disposal of the, the trash. It has access to a landfill for that. Um, there are, this is much more programmatic and visionary in the sense of what can the city do within its sphere of opportunity. Um, and because of the, uh, I would say the more functional or operational needs that were identified early on in this process, instead of being a longer looking vision, like maybe we could have done if all the um, pieces were well tuned right now, there's been a lot of work spent to figure out how to write the system in order to set you on a good path forward um, beyond this point in time, both for any new programs you implement, but then something down the road. And I know there's talk within the Environmental Commission of uh, a zero waste strategy, zero waste plan, which the city has never had, despite having the, the policy or the goal. And I'm sorry, Jim's gonna comment's gonna be the last one that we're gonna take right now, just so we can get into some of the material and make sure we have time to get through the materials. Yeah, and just to set the stage for that, um, you mentioned financial sustainability. It seems to me, both at the last meeting and I think in an email ahead of time, uh, the whole story about where is the enterprise fund at, what is the real state of financial affairs, and that's something that it doesn't seem to me that there's actually been a validation that this is unsustainable in a way that might say we have to make black and white decisions here. And so that's comment number one. And comment number two, relative to things like the drop-off station, along with the other, a lot of other current assets, what I would consider strengths of the Ann Arbor program in a community where we have lots of multifamily, we have a thriving downtown, we have a university. It's not your typical comparable community. And so when I look at some of the choices up there, and I think as an example of the drop-off, and then we're looking at a, a bulky waste collection at the curb, I think some folks at the last meeting heard me say that your predecessors, the public works director, spent nearly 20 years of his life getting us out of that business and helping the drop-off become the reasonable alternative. So that's an example of where there's some of the strengths that we have that seems like we're, we're maybe letting go of and not building on, and that'll be part of my comments as we walk through the material here. Yeah, and so we'll get into um, you know, some of the comments uh, on, on the recommendations specifically. Some of the items that we did retain, like the bulky item, um, ties back to what we heard from the residents in the resident survey. Um, we asked residents what program they would most like to, to see the city um, institute, and there was uh, equal high support for year-round residential compost and for bulky item collection. So I think that the drop-off station does provide a good service that this community obviously takes uh, good use of, but there is a portion of the community that still, and a substantial portion of the community at a 25 or 27% that said we need something at our curb for that pickup. Um, you know, we're, this is a heavily student populated community. Not a lot of people have necessarily either the funds or the um, 
a vehicle to be able to transport larger items to the drop-off station to get rid of them. So this would provide a convenience. So we did retain it for that reason, and it's the same type of reason that we included the student move-in and move-out option, which we heard a lot of um, feedback on last month, and uh, there was concern about primarily, I think, how that gets paid for, who carries the cost of that, but there is an obvious need around that. There are students that move out and they have little care for where their material goes, and the city is the backstop to make sure that that's taken care of. So we wanted to make sure that we structured a program that would allow the city to plan for that and provide that service um, in order to meet all of those different aims. So again, we've got these competing demands, only so many resources to be able to uh, work with. How can we best do that? So what I want to get into uh, the two things that we didn't really talk about prior to today, and in fact last month I said specifically we weren't talking about um, at that point was how do we pay for our programs. Uh, so in your packet there were uh, pros and cons of different funding options and there's two real uh, primary funding options we look at. One is a um, assessment based funding which is the millage that is currently providing about 75% of the revenue into the system. Um, the other would be a user fee type of a, um, a funding where individual users are billed for services based on some type of um, metric, whether it's a flat fee across the board or if it's uh, something that's a graduated fee depending on the type of service they select and the frequency of service. And that's about another 17% of where the funding comes from um, into the program now. So 75% is millage, 17% is the user fee type funds mostly from the commercial sector for their collection. Um, and the last 7% comes from royalties and um, other um, revenue share from the recycling stream uh, that helps to offset portions of those costs as well. So we have a third option, which is the blended millage and user fee, which really is reflective of what your system is currently. Um, and these are just some of the key factors that we look at. So funding, and, funding sustainability or stability and reliability. Um, on the property tax millage, that's pretty stable. We know what it's going to be. We know what the assessed value of the properties is. People are pretty sure to pay their tax bills and there's a pretty consistent amount of non-payment and the city has the ability to place liens to get those property taxes paid. So that revenue comes into the system, it's pretty well guaranteed. On a user fee basis, you get a higher rate of non-payment. Uh, monthly bills going to a resident or to a business that may or may not be paid. Uh, you may not have as much teeth to be able to recover those dollars and you um, end up having to build in more um, room for that bad debt that you would end up carrying. And then on that blended basis again, it's kind of that we might have stability, but that's because we're getting portion of it from the uh, more stable millage type of uh, funding. Um, transparency, what do we mean by transparency? Does the resident see it? Does the business see it? Do they know what they're paying for? On the property taxes, a lot of people probably don't realize that it's on there or they don't know what services it pays for. They don't really think about what their trash or their recycling or their composting service costs because either the truck comes by, it picks up whatever they set out as long as it's set out by the rules, and they don't ever write a check to the city. They don't have to pay a bill. When you get into a user fee, now you're seeing more transparency and a lot of times in those systems there's an option to choose what level of fee you want to pay or what level of service you want to have and a more direct connection with what that cost is. Now you're thinking a little more about what it costs you for that service, more like your other utilities. Um, and that's where you see you know, people shop around their, their internet service or their cable TV service. Um, we don't have the option of shopping around the trash service, but if you set up a, a tiered structure for the, um, the cost of their garbage cart, people might make a decision based on either the economic driver or based on the you know, level of service they believe that they need and what they're willing to pay for that. Flexibility and adjustability. The millage is really difficult to adjust. It's not very flexible. Um, so you have to plan within it. The nice thing about it is you know how much you're going to get um, because we have those assessed values, we know what that millage rate is. So you can plan around it, um, but if you have an unexpected cost increase like we've seen over the last few years with the cost for recycling processing being higher than it had historically been, uh, you're not able to adapt that funding um, coming in to offset that cost. And you have to find other ways to absorb it um, or start cutting into fund balances. Um, with a user fee, you may have more ability to be able to adjust that. It still would probably, in, in the case of the city's services, may require city council to vote on changing that user fee. Uh, but in order to change the millage, it has to go to the voters. Um, so the, the flexibility is a little bit greater on the user fee. 
Um, reflective of differences between customers? Yes, all of these can be reflective of the differences between customers. On the property tax millage, it's based on the differences in the economic status or, or the cost of the property, the value of the property, um, which often ties back to their economic status. Um, on a user fee basis, if the rate is a variable rate, then that reflects those differences in users based on their um, need or demand for service or their selection of service. Uh, con consistency with other services, again, property tax millage, yes, we're familiar with that. That's how we fund our police and fire services. That's how our schools are funded. Um, on user fees, that's how our other utilities are paid for. So everybody's familiar with either one of these approaches. Um, and that gets into this customer support as well that we had customer support through the resident survey for both um, maintaining the current funding through the millage. Um, people were, were satisfied with that, uh, knowing that they pay different pr amounts based on their property value as opposed to their service. Um, but they were also supportive of a user fee provided that the rate would vary, not if the rate was fixed and flat all across all different users. So when we think, when we get into the recommendations, we're going to be thinking more about um, you when know, we've got costs identified in there, um, how do we recover those costs? And in some cases, it would be nice to be able to put it into the millage, pull it from those millage funds, um, provided that there's revenue there for that. Other services like a bulky pickup or like student move in and move out might make more sense to be a user fee because there's a less um, impact to the entire community. It might be available to everyone, but really only utilized by a subset of people. So the other element is service delivery options. This is who does the service. Um, we have a mixed system now. We started at the very first meeting by laying out the complex um, mix of service providers and who provides service in different segments of the population. Um, and one of the things that we are basing our assumptions on in this is that services need to be streamlined. We're going to need to consolidate and streamline services in order to provide more clarity, uh, less confusion, both for the customer and for the city's customer service um, responding to that, and result in cost efficiencies to be able to operate as uh, smoothly as possible and at lowest cost as possible. Um, so when we're deciding who provides services, it's either they're going to be the city or it's going to be a contractor. And we've assumed that the contracted provider in every case for any of these programs is not just an open market type of an option, um, which a lot of communities do have, especially on their commercial side. Um, this instead is something that the city would contract for those services on behalf of its residents or on behalf of its businesses in order to um, pool those resources, provide some continuity and some um, control over being able to drive further policy, um, whether it's diversion or um, level of service type requirements. So we've got, again, our factors for consideration. The ability to absorb cost increases when the city performs it, you're paying the cost no matter what. Cost goes up, you have to be able to pay for those costs because you are your own provider. If you have a contract, you do benefit when costs increase. Um, cost increases happen because that contract locks the um, rate and that contractor has to absorb those cost increases. And um, I would know we've got a few um, contractors in the room who have probably gone through their fair share of times when they've both benefited from and suffered from um, that position of, of having to just deal with the contract rate until that contract is up or until they have a negotiation to increase um, their costs to balance out those costs. Um, Likewise, on the cost savings, the city gets to immediately realize its cost savings if it's providing services. Um, the contractor gets to realize those savings if they have that contracted rate again. Um, and may, through a negotiation, offer to share some of those savings back, but that's you know the nature of contracts is you kind of get a give and take and uh, hope that it evens out over the term of that agreement. Flexibility and adjustability. Um, the city can choose to change its services, provided it has the resources in place to do that at any point in time uh, if they're performing the service. If they're working with a contractor, that contractor would have to agree to provide that service um, as a change to the scope within the contract. Sometimes can be done, sometimes it's more difficult to do or it causes an increase to your cost or an impact to your costs. 
Um, control over quality of service, yes. In the case of the city, the city is very responsive to the customer needs. They're the um, last and only line of defense for themselves. So they try to do everything they can to satisfy the customer, including going back when they say that we're not going to pick up uh, something that's sitting outside the cart. Eventually they go back and they pick up something sitting outside the cart um, because they know that no one else is going to do it. Uh, that may be the case also with a contracted provider. A lot of contractors are very good about providing a high level of service. They want to maintain that customer satisfaction, um, but they also have the ability to push back through their contracts and say, our contract doesn't say we have to do this, or our contract says we'll do that, but we also get to charge you a higher cost. Um, and then potential for cost efficiencies. On this one, contractors are a benefit um, because a lot of times they're working for multiple communities. They have a bigger pool of resources and experience to draw from rather than the city that uh, performs just for its residents, its businesses within its borders with a limited amount of equipment or fleet um, and lesser diverse experience from uh, working with other communities or seeing how they can provide services in other places. So the last thing I want to go through, in your packet, the very first page of your packet, gave um, four baseline assumptions. Um, we used these baseline assumptions as a starting point for all of these recommendations that we've developed. Um, and the baseline assumptions really have been developed out of all the work on this project to date. Um, what we've heard from all of our stakeholders through the interviews, through these meetings, through the downtown focus group, um, through the resident survey. Uh, what we saw through doing the cost of service analysis, looking at benchmark communities. Um, and all of these things are, these are musts that have to be addressed or are being addressed in order to allow for new options or changes to be made um, as these recommendations would get implemented. So the very first one is that revenues have to increase to sustain current services and fund new services. I know we haven't shared a fund projection with you. There have been fund projections that the city has shared previously, has developed. Um, I, it was asked for at the last meeting to provide some uh, snapshot of where current fund um, costs for this year and uh, fund balance sits, uh, but the budget was voted on last night. So it was a little bit of a, we lost the, uh, well, we lost the battle on um, whether we got, had any resources to be able to pull that together because budget took pre precedence over that. Uh, but what I can tell you is that uh, nothing has changed really from the FY18 cost of service that we did um, to improve conditions where we, that we saw there. Um, recycling has continued to be costly and in fact the uh, cost this year for recycling processing looks like it's going to be about a half a million dollars more than it was last year. Um, that's based on very depressed commodity markets. So at the beginning of FY18, the city was receiving revenue share around $70 per ton for the recycling that was collected. Um, currently, it is about $25 per ton. Um, that is a direct hit on every single ton that we collect for recycling, um, and it makes it a uh, costly service to provide, uh, which we have to be able to accommodate because I don't think that any of us are going to advocate for doing less recycling. Um, so with that, we had a uh, operating uh, surplus last year around $500,000. That $500,000 increase in recycling costs eradicates that. We're basically um, looking like it's going to be maybe break even, maybe even a small loss this year without taking into account any of the financial adjustments that come at the back end. And we talked about that when we did the cost of service, the pension costs, um, employee benefit costs. Those have adjustments that happen each year, and we're not expecting to see anything significant um, within those. And in fact, one is starting to work on a credit basis, um, so the liability is reducing. Um, and in fact, I can give you those numbers because I jotted them down. So on the benefits, pension benefits are um, a credit of $250,000 on the liability, but on the uh, GASB liabilities, it's still an added cost of 275000 Those more or less net out against each other. Um, so those adjustments shouldn't be as big of an impact, but if we're not breaking even or if we're not building a surplus on the, um, on the direct operations, then there still is going to be a revenue shortage if we try to implement anything new, unless we can achieve some cost savings somewhere else. Um, Second thing is that customer service has to be revamped or overhauled. And with this, we're not talking about something where we need to come in and do something radical. It's really process improvement. It's communication. It's coordination to make sure that uh, the path from 
the issue identification to issue resolution is clear and is coordinated within the city. One of the things that we heard from customer service when we spoke with them um, during the interview phase was that they could enter a work order, it would be picked up um, by the supervisor in collections and closed out because they were on their way to go and correct it, but the resident would call back and say it hasn't been corrected yet and then there's a, a break in the, the communication to know, you know, it's, they don't know that it's being taken care of. There is a lot that's been done since we've started this process to improve those types of conditions. Um, so that's something that has just continually been improved um, and continual focus. Not necessarily a real cost associated with it, so we haven't built it into the recommendations. It's just more of an awareness within those groups of staff that are from different departments and working better together. Um, similarly, on number three, operational improvements and upgrades need to be made to sustain current programs. Um, those things need to continue. The city has to buy new trucks when it needs new trucks. There are costs associated with that that gets built in in the budgeting process. Um, there are costs to retrain or train new um, employees. All of that has to continue to happen and we assume that that continues to happen uh, within the context of any of these programs. And then the fourth is that services are streamlined and consolidated. Um, this comes back again to simplification for the customer being clear to the community of who provides what services, but also within the different contractors, who's responsible for what and how can we best provide all of those services. Um, we've identified some recommendations to actually get to that end, um, which we'll talk about when we get into the recommendations section. Um, at this point, I think we're gonna turn it back to Charlie for a minute. So we've covered uh, funding, baseline assumptions, and service options, correct? Christina. So what we'd like you to do is discuss uh, what we've laid out. It's relatively new material, or at least new in the focus we're putting on it today, and then we'll field any questions you have, and then we'll move into more detail on the recommendations. Okay, so if you could spend four or five minutes talking with your partner about what you've just heard. If you have any questions, we'll field them. Okay? So ready, set, go. All righty. Let's take your questions. We'll board them and then we'll respond to them. Uh, hopefully we'll be able to group a couple of them together. Yeah. We'll see how much, how much we get. Okay. So you have the mic? All right. Let's go to this side of the room first. Any questions about the material or conversation that occurred at the start of the meeting? Any questions on this side or comments? David. I guess one of our questions uh, was, and maybe it's our own fault, is not a full understanding of how the uh, county uh, initiatives are going to fit in with what the city is trying to do uh, through this process today. I guess that was our main question. Do you want to add anything? Yeah, I also, I had a question about, um, we had a breakdown of like the amount that the of total revenues that the millage contributes to and user fees. And I, w I was wondering w what that looks like in terms of like uh, commercial pickup in restaurants in particular, but that's kind of really specific, I guess. Okay, uh, not full understanding of Warma and how that would fit into the, into the uh, plan. And then what's the commercial total revenue? Is that what you asked? Okay. So you're talking about the. I mean, whether or not like the broader community is subsidizing that with. The split proportion. Okay, and and subsidy. Okay. Any other questions? Yes, Tom. Uh, I'd like to see um, this since today is our last meeting. I'd like to see a, a vote on some of these issues, uh, including today, uh, including adding the drop-off station uh, enhancement. Uh, I'd like to see this group support the MRF recommendations and have that be included uh, in the report. Um, I'd like to have a vote on the service consolidation issue uh, because that would basically mean that Recycle Ann Arbor would be out of the collection business. Um, bulky item collection, 
I, I did not see uh, strong support for that at the last meeting, so I'm, I'm confused as to why that's in the draft recommendations. Okay. I call it bulky waste rationale. Can I speak to the No, not yet. Okay, okay let's, let's board them all. Okay, yes? Um, I still have questions about the commercial ordinance enforcement and the cost on that. I know that there is increased collection fees as well as some administration to fund it, but I guess I'm curious as to what's happening now with their trash and what would be the negative situation if we didn't deal with that because I'm unclear. Is this... It just seems like since it's the largest thing on the page. The other thing We're that... We're going to get into that when we get into options. But great. Uh, the other thing that came up was the service consolidation. I wasn't clear. Tom, you make it sound like it's kind of pushing Recycle Ann Arbor out. I hadn't heard that. Um, but I also am wondering why it's listed under residential because it seems like it would be across the board for commercial and residential and not just in residential. So the question is, uh, what does service consolidation really mean? Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah, and is it only toward residential or would okay. it incorporate That's all aspects? Scope. Okay, any other questions on this side? Yes. Yeah, I want to endorse uh, Tom's points um, and the questions just raised because we were talking together. Um, but to elaborate on a couple of things, um, on the bulky waste collection, it seemed that we could use the same logic that you use for the e-waste and household hazardous waste study, that there is a system out there and so let's help people use that system better. I personally, and I would hope the whole committee would not support free bulky waste collection. We know from the past experience and experience in other communities, it's like opening Pandora's box on that. I also, um, the point that was just made about service consolidation, if indeed one of our goals also is diversion, then what I would like to see is service consolidation around diversion, not under the artificial residential and commercial mix. As I was saying earlier, we have a highly integrated community with commercial and residential and residential and commercial. And so I see this more as a, here's recycling and diversion and here's waste. And that's a better approach to consolidating. And I think that's- Consolidate around diversion. Around diversion, okay. Has there been any effort whatsoever to estimate how much diversion would occur. And just as a perfect example, if we go to year-round compost collection, we know it would cost, presumably, if the estimate is accurate, it would cost $140,000. Right. The benefit is increased diversion. Right. Well, how much diversion do we get for $140,000? How much greenhouse gas reduction do we get? And the presumption is that there ought to be a way to at least make some guesstimate of that. Okay. I just have a major process concern, and I'll put it in the context of the city council meeting last night, where council deliberated probably for four hours over cost issues that ranged from maybe a couple hundred thousand dollars each. And if you add up everything that we're doing here, we're talking about several million dollars. And um, we don't have a clear understanding of the financial situation. I pose questions. Um, Christina addressed some of those. Um, we don't know um, diversion rates. We don't know the cost per ton of the additional diversion rate for the various scenarios. We don't know the cost per additional greenhouse gas reduction for each one of the options. And we're trying to pack all of this in to one hour. I, I really have concerns. So what I hear you saying is that you don't think that this group can weigh in on effectively on these recommendations? Correct. Is that the summary of what you're saying? Not, not in the time allotted. Okay. And not with the information that's yeah. been provided to us. Okay. Some diversion rate was provided last I, week. I believe last diversion week. rates were provided as well as estimates on the greenhouse gases last meeting. We but have, we have a quantified greenhouse Right, but um, well, you did quantify diversion, didn't diversion you? Diversion was quantified in the packet from that Right, but okay. not on a per, per dollar cost basis. So we can't compare alternatives. Really. It was for those options that had, not, never, not every option had diversion. Right, that's fair. Okay, we have. Yep. Um, well, Nancy. our group looked at funding and service delivery in the commercial districts and felt that uh, one model is a special assessment district where it would be variable to each business 
based on the output or the type of waste they do. So restaurants that have a lot more stuff to, to dispose of that's timely and needs to be picked up, it would be so they pay more for that than other businesses. It wouldn't be by square footage, which is the usual mechanism for judging these things. And then it would also be some flexibility to a range of surfaces that people could get more, um, uh, more frequent pickups or a wider range of things besides mm -hmm. the basics. So you want the planners to look at a special dis assessment district? That's what I'm hearing you say, right? Okay. Uh, the thing I wanted to raise is about, um, is, is about environmental goals, greenhouse gas goals, air pollution goals, recycling, recycling mm -hmm. rates. And, you know, when we, I think the very first meeting when there was an anal analysis done of where there's opportunity to improve recycling rates in the community, it was very clear that the biggest, the, the, the biggest potential area is in the commercial sector. We've got relatively low rates there. We've got a program that was put in place but never really, really implemented. Now, that's one of the options that's on the list, and it's got a big price tag by it. I, I'm, not clear about the, I, I'm not clear about the analysis that gets to the big number, but what I wonder about is whether there's a way to begin implementing in that sector um, in a smaller way. In a, in a way that doesn't in a way that doesn't cost one whatever one and a half million dollars million dollars a year, okay. but let's just get moving in this in this area. Okay. So commercial enforcement cost. Why is it so high? Correct. Well, if there if there are other approaches that will get us that that'll move us, if there are other approaches that will move us okay. forward at a small at a lower cost. Okay. So that's a nice suite of questions. I just want, I want to make one clarification or thought uh, with what uh, Nancy said about a special assessment district. In the downtown area, uh, I'm a proponent of a special dis district assessment per user. You might have a 10 or 20,000 square foot building that might be mercantile in office that produces a very small footprint of, of, of refuse and it mostly will be cardboard versus even a 2,000, 1,500 square foot store mm -hmm. that's a bar or restaurant that produces a tremendous amount. We have examples of both in our real estate holdings and I would like ideally to have the user who produces l largely uh, food driven be the responsible party rather than a special assessment on a building which would hold somebody who isn't responsible for that refuse to be responsible. So the assessment's related to usage, not, not just properties, based. Okay. Okay. Okay, so here's what we've got. We've got quite a suite of comments here. I'd, I'd like to address uh, one right off the bat and then another one. So, Creston, would you cover the drop-off station? That's come up a few times. Yeah, so the drop-off station is actually to try to uh, keep it concise, is really a part of the authority discussion and in fact was a catalyst most likely for the discussions with the county to uh, create an authority. It's a quick backdrop, the drop-off station uh, in place that the uh, City of Ann Arbor citizens use is actually a regional facility. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Brad, but the last surveys I've, over years, basically 50% of the users are city residents, 50% are out county. and yet it's a city facility. We maintain it, try to keep it up. Uh, Recycle Ann Arbor programs it. They take the revenue, they have the, the costs and the revenues to program it. But that really is a regional facility and really needs a regional solution that really the city hasn't been uh, in the position or in the decision to fully invest in a brand new replacement drop off using city millage dollars by city funds for a regional facility that really needs a regional approach. And so the, the authority, WARMA, and in fact a study that was uh, done jointly with the, the county's got the first logo, but the city supported it, uh, was done actually by Jim's firm IRS, really looked at the county as a whole and identified that and replacement of that as a key piece to a broader countywide and regional approach. And so really the, the WARMA authority is gonna be a key piece to that, how that shakes out. And so really that's been a, a piece we've been waiting to see how our replacement drop-off station fits in that bigger puzzle uh, rather than these direct ones uh, strategies as Charlie has put it and also that uh, the 
and we'll get into it, I guess, into the bulky pickup, but it wasn't to okay. replace the drop-off, but to, to augment. So. so what I heard you say is that input about the drop-off station is, is, will be factored into the warm discussion, mm -hmm. correct? Yeah. But okay. Can I, just, can I just respond really quickly on this? The thing is, we've been having this discussion in the city since, I think, 2003, some, something like that. I mean, a really, really long time. I chaired the city's Green Belt Commission when we recommended mm -hmm. I guess to add, and we, we'll certainly do that, and Christine and I were talking in that, yeah, and even mentioning the warma, but just to point out, like, the separate area where I used to live, it's been in the CIP for at least that long, too, waiting for that outside funding piece along with ours, and so it hasn't been often forgotten. It's waiting for that right I opportunity. So. Okay. And we can, yep, so we, I'd love we, to We need to move on. We can do it. We have yep. a whole... We have a whole constellation of recommendations we need. The related aspect of that is there's a synergy with the bulky waste. Mm -hmm. you know, right now, a citizen goes out there, they have to pay a fee because the city stopped paying the, the minor operating subsidy. And that's an example of how I would much rather, on the bulky waste issue, just support, let's make that open for free, and then the bulky waste thing becomes less important. That's an example of some of the dynamics between these things. They're all integrated. And, uh, if we get back to my core proposition in the beginning, which is one of the strategies here, is service expansion, okay? What you're talking about is service improvement, right? Integration. Integration, the service improvement. What I heard Crescent say is that the city's addressing that through the WARMA strategy. Is that correct? Okay. That's what we're looking to do. I wanted to get to this process issue here because that was brought up a few times. And the word vote. One of the first questions I ask, and I've done a few projects for the city, is the group that I'm going to be working with a decision-making body? And I asked that question, obviously, when we started this, and the response was no. This is a body that will give us input, and we'd appreciate it if you'd ask for their opinion on the recommendations that we emerge with. So. A vote would not be called for given the grounds of the scope of work and how I personally have constructed the process with you, all right? But what I heard you say is, another way of phrasing this is, we'd like to express our opinion on these topics. Is that where you're at, Tom? Or do you actually want, you know, 35 people here to raise their hands yes or no? Why not? Why not take a vote on it? I, I, I would, the answer from a process standpoint is, a, this isn't a topic that we've explored in a stepwise fashion with this group. The amount of information is not equally distributed among the people for either the drop-off station or the MRF recommendation. Neither of those show up in any of the options that Aptum has created. So that's the major why not. But that's why we're all here. Right. We all have a piece of that puzzle. Which, thank you, Steve. You know, that we hope to contribute to the Right, so what do we do about these topics? Well, there's a couple things. There's a couple options. One of which is on July 25th, Apton's gonna be presenting their final set of recommendations to the Environmental Commission. So that's coming up in July. Obviously, that's two months from now. And so I think you plan to provide a report, your final report to, these, to this group prior to that meeting, right? Okay, so there will be an opportunity for you to express your opinion and your feedback on the report. Now, if the city believes that these are important enough that they want to conduct another meeting with you, that they want to direct Aptum to develop material around this, obviously I'm not opposed to it as, as a facilitator. If that's something, you know, Crescent, who's the contract manager, wants to do, if, if he wants to tell Aptum, hey, I want you to look at the drop-off station and the MRF 
And service consolidation, I think you've already looked at that, right? We're, I'm going to ask you to respond to that, then we're going to move on. That's something that's up to Crescent. So how many people would like the city to take a very close look at drop-off station, MRF recommendation, we're going to hear about service consolidation. They've already taken a close look at that. So how many people would like that? A follow-on effort to look at that. Okay. So, so I'm... I, I, actually, I think we're going to... I just want to see it included. You know, there's enough knowledge in the city to write it up. All three of them. So I'm just saying... See it as included as what? In the, in the plan. A, as a... Okay. As a uh, That's what I uh, this is a little different. <laughs> I, and I can speak to the MRF option. The MRF we are planning to incorporate based on whatever, however far the information okay. gets okay, so we uh, from the proposal that's standing out there now. But that is still something being negotiated. So there won't be final information on it, but it is something that we will be including. Um, there wasn't, uh, well, you can frankly, stop the, there, yeah. yeah. So yay for, yay for Christina. She's going to include <laughs> the MRF. How about the drop-off station? That's already included. Correct me if I'm wrong, Theo, but... The study that was done, and this was before your time, so I know I'm putting you on the spot unfairly. But, mm -hmm. but yes, a report that was done uh, at the time and coordinated with the county plan amendment. In essence, that plan's been done and lays out an approach and strategy for those, including replacing the Ann Arbor drop-off station. I mean, this plan is being built within that context. So by de facto, probably not the right words, but we're already saying yes. Okay. It's already there. So that can certainly be restated reinforced and uh, referenced and that that's already there and certainly and actually just as a quick because this has come up as kind of a bit out of the blue of the topic I will get Charlie a link to the P or the PDF it's pretty thick uh, dense uh, item but we'll get that out and include it in the meeting <coughs> summary as well so people can get all up to speed on what's already been uh, done in the work done on that okay Service consolidation? So on the service consolidation basis, we are looking at that. It is built into the recommendations we're going to go through. Um, the service consolidation, typically in communities, residential services and commercial services are completely separated. Residential services typically are falling under either a city-provided service or a contracted service. Commercial services oftentimes are just open market. We are recommending in the set of recommendations that you have that the city provide all residentially minded collection services, including the recycling collection service that right now is provided by RAA under its contract, which is going to be extended June 3rd by a year, um, but then subsequent to that would have to be rebid. Um, and that is because the city, we're looking for that communication to the resident to be clear of who provides services. Um, the city is well positioned to do that. Uh, and there is a significant cost savings that we have projected to come along with that of $350,000 per year um, on that basis. So that all fits together um, in a nice consolidated package on the residential side. On the commercial side, there already is a lot of consolidation because of the commercial franchise and the city is looking to further consolidate that. Uh, we're still discussing with staff there are um, other requirements in, um, in place because of uh, staffing and requirements to maintain city staff uh, within certain um, numbers or positions that we need to still work through. Um, that is outside of this group um, that those conversations are happening, but we certainly want to hear your feedback through things like the recommendations on um, the downtown where we are recommending a consolidation not only of uh, the service providers but the services themselves to get down to shared containers and improve those services. Well, this, is, this is an example, I think, of some of the frustration. The, the last time we talked about this, from my point of view, was meeting number one. And there was feedback that said, ah, you know, that's not quite as easy an answer as you just presented. And here you are on the very last moment uh, in the matrix chart with only one criteria, which is operating efficiency and not related on any of the other criteria, is it's back again. And it's back in what I call a traditional thinking about residential commercial. And Ann Arbor is not a traditional town. Our recycling program is deep into all commercial. It's deep into downtown. And that's really where, from my point of view, thinking about the system from an operating efficiency, I think you can still reach your $350,000 in savings, but recognize that a standard residential commercial probably is not the smart thing to do when you've got curb cart pickup, when you've got roll-off recycling pickup and, uh, and uh, dumpster recycling pickup. Those are slightly different things. And so I, the frustration, I think, is here we are talking about this with another 
half a minute to dedicate to this topic. And that's not good. I think that where this has evolved from is we have all talked about streamlining services, consolidating services from day one. We've heard it through all of the interviews that we had. Uh, there are a number of ways that it can be done. Um, where there is a separate provider on recycling and a separate pr provider on trash, there is competition between the two that is not beneficial to the city. Uh, it is not likely to drive diversion. In fact, it is likely to drive adverse behaviors if you have two separate contractors or two separate service providers in those same sectors. I, we, there has been a lot of discussion around this topic. There has been within staff, um, within our own experience, the uh, services can be provided in a number of ways, really. There are, and it comes down to a choice of priority. And one of the very first thing that we heard from all of our stakeholders, and that many of you have said, is we need more clarity, we need more streamlining, we need consolidation. There needs to be a way to deliver services that is, uh, thoughtful to the resident that is driving towards a uniform messaging. And again, that's an option that could have been looked at. Uh, it has been the practice, so we do have the information on it. And the recommendation that is here for you to all weigh in on is to consolidate it to the city. Um, so we'll be looking for your feedback on that. And that's part of what our purpose is here today, is to get the feedback. Well, one of the things that's just been difficult for me personally and other people I've talked to is that I thought, I've always thought one of the real tangible deliverables of this whole contract was having a, having a financial model that the city could use going forward, you know, a spreadsheet basically that just says, okay, here's, much, here's what, you know, it's costing to do curbside collection. Here are the factors that are going into it. If we tweak things here and there, where would we see efficiencies in other places? You know what I mean? That's what I mean by a financial model. And it's, so I, it's, it's be, it, it has been developed through the cost of service. It has yeah. been used for costing out the uh, recommendations that you have in front of you today. It is not a tool that is for public consumption, though, because it has a lot of uh, intricacies within it. You can't, it's not as simple as I'm going to change this number and it's going to roll all the way through. It requires analysis by staff to be able to gather the outputs for that. Um, but it is a tool that is going to be available as an outcome of this project. Well, that's good. But, um, um, okay. Uh, we don't have time to really go through this whole topic here. So what we do want to do, and we do only have a bit of time left, is go through the recommendations. Um, Charlie, were there any of the other questions that we needed to provide response yeah, to? Yeah, there was. Um, Kristen, on the understanding of WARMA, uh, you were going to give us a citation to distribute, right? A URL that will have the plan? Okay. Um, you're going to cover the bulky waste issue when you mm -hmm. get to that one, correct? And as far as the GHG and the diversion, you'll cover that mm -hmm. in total. Okay. All right. Yep. Um, all right. So again, as we presented the options last month, we're also going to present the recommendations in very similar fashion. We have, and we're not going to break into groups on each one of these individually. We would never get done. So on the residential side, we advanced the options and formalized the recommendations that were presented to you. So we've got a recommendation to implement year-round residential compost, curbside textile collection, uh, bulky item collection. Um, one that we have two recommendations that reference e-waste and HHW, and then the service consolidation for the uh, curbside collection with all services provided by the city. So a couple of things I want to point out here. On the year-round compost collection, we do have identified that it would reduce greenhouse gases. Um, we are going to be running through those calculations to come up with the, cal the actual estimates um, that we will present in the plan. Um, where we will actually get savings on that is there are residents now that use third-party uh, providers to come and pick up leaves past the regular leaf collection season. Um, those are poorly routed. It's a lot of additional traffic. What we don't have is the information on how many of those there are, or how much mileage that might be, uh, but we'll be able to calculate the transportation-related emissions that would be added by city collection for that service. Um, and what the offset is by gathering the food waste that we've estimated to be diverted through that um, in order to calculate the greenhouse gases for it. 
Um, on the uh, curbside textile collection, again, yes, there would be transportation-related greenhouse gas emissions with that um, because of the, the curbside collection item. Um, and we'll be looking to see if there is a offset that uh, we can calculate for the diversion of the textiles that would be generated. Um, bulky item collection, I know this is one that there wasn't a lot of support for from this group, but because there was support through the resident survey from the general public uh, and a uh, perceived need that they have for that, we wanted to make sure that we addressed how that service could be provided so that uh, if it is decided at some point to implement it, there is information on the cost and the resources required. And that would be viewed as something that would supplement, as Crescent said, the drop-off station. It would supplement the existing thrift outlets and other donation outlets, um, but provide that backstop of the extra material that uh, sometimes you have in your home that you would need to get rid of, rather than having to call a private service provider um, for that. And could be set up with a user fee to fund it um, so that only those who actually use the service are paying for it. On the e-waste and HHW, we recommend that that stay as a regional effort. Um, those are regional programs now. The county does provide programs for those. Um, there's also options at the drop-off station for that. So this would focus more towards the promotion and encouragement of residents to use those existing programs. And then if something regionally were to develop, to look at how the city would participate in that. And we talked about the service consolidation element um, that has instead of a cost, an actual cost savings that would be uh, projected um, for that. And so all in on the residential side, $150,000 of direct cost impact if all of these options were to be, re were to be implemented all at the same time. Um, something we are not advocating is don't implement every recommendation at once. Um, we are looking for your feedback today on how you would rank these, what your priority would be for these, partially to help phase what the timing of implementation would be and the need for new revenue would be um, in order to support any of these options. Can I, you're, are you through with this one? That was him. Yeah. Okay. So what we're going to ask you to do is force rank, uh, sorry, we're going to ask you to force rank these options on a one through five, which ones you think are the most important would get a one, the second most important would get a two, obviously. But as you do that, I wanted to ask you a question which has emerged in my mind as I've listened to this conversation unfold, which is, should we have another meeting to deal in more detail with the kinds of questions that have emerged here? Of course, the contract only called for four meetings and in order to do another meeting, city would have to do what it does to change contracts and scope and those kinds of things, but obviously it's not an impossible task. So how many of you would like a fifth meeting, assuming that the preparation in advance covers the topics that have, let me finish please, that have emerged here and the passion and, and energy around these topics that emerged? How many of you would like that meeting? And Jan, you had a question. I wonder if we couldn't do something sim something that would address the issues electronically rather than, you know, setting up a whole other meeting. Well, I love a tr electronic meetings, but given the emotion, right? Are you suggest Are you suggest Are you suggesting a, a, a webinar document to answer the questions? Yeah. Uh, okay. Scales, scales, you know, right. That, that would be uh, something we could do. I would say based on the, the passion and energy, I would recommend that we meet together again. But I wouldn't recommend it until I found out if that's something you thought was appropriate. So how many feel like a fifth meeting would be helpful? We have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. So I, I would say definite majority. So Kristen, you'll take that under advisement, correct? So in the meantime, if you could force rank these residential options, I'm um, recommendations, if you could force rank these residential operation uh, recommendations right now, take a minute silently to do that. We're not going to do this in a group setting. I have a quick process question. Do we have to rate all, all five? I mean, some, some things by simply by rating it indicates that we favor it, even though we may not favor it. If we give it like a three or a four vote, can we just rate one and two and then or? That would be fine. That would be fine, John. Thanks for that clarification.
The other option is to cross it out and say, that's a real stupid idea, but okay. <laughs> that's my usual response. All right, commercial. All right, so on the commercial side, we've got the fog management. This is really, uh, if you remember from last month, this is an ordinance that uh, requirement that would require reporting and um, standards of operation so that there is better control and data collection around this activity. This would also, if there are uh, restaurants that are not currently collecting their yellow grease and that should be, uh, would be a outreach tool to them to be able to get them operating properly, maintaining the sewer system more appropriately. Um, along with that. So really more of a data-driven effort and uh, environmental uh, you know, wastewater quality effort on that. Uh, and the commercial organics collection, um, this is a voluntary um, option that would be incorporated within the next commercial franchise um, so that the businesses that would choose to have the service would elect to utilize it. Uh, we started with voluntary because the um, Practice isn't implemented already in the city. There isn't a base of experience for working through it um, within the denser downtown area. And uh, quality of compost is very important. So we want to start with those who are most motivated to uh, do the service properly and properly prepare their materials, build a base of experience that they can then be um, positioned to serve as champions for the program for others and grow that participation in an organic way, pardon the pun. Um, on student move in and move out, again, this is something that we did not see strong support from this group for, um, but it is a, a recognized need and the city has had to respond to it on a seasonal basis, um, even this year having to uh, quickly prepare to provide an emergency type of a service to be responsive to requests for additional pickup. Uh, rather than providing the service in that type of a fashion, we did price out what it would be to um, perform it in a more holistic sense and plan for it. Um, and that, like the bulky, could be an option where um, just those properties who are impacted would be bearing the cost. It does not um, seem reasonable necessarily for that to be borne by all users of the system. On the C&D tracking, we talked about this last month that really Construction and demolition is a, a waste stream that we know is significant in the city. You can see it driving around with um, redevelopment happening. And there is not a good um, broad infrastructure within the region to provide for processing and recycling of that material unless the properties or the contractors are willing to and have the space to segregate it themselves. Um, in order to start driving the development of that infrastructure, and in order to gauge what uh, impact there would be on the diversion because we don't have data on current C&D quantities. Um, we're recommending a phased approach with the first phase being um, starting to track where those materials are going and how much material is generated from construction and demolition projects and uh, developing a database that then would be utilized to formulate a requirement for diversion and setting it up so that the ordinance is clear that that is what is coming um, in order to drive contractors towards that frame of thinking and drive the private industry who may come in and set up that um, processing infrastructure to see that there is a market need for that. Um, that could have a regional benefit as well um, and I think would be appropriate for discussions with WARMA to um, advance on if the city was to choose to be part of the regional authority. And then on the commercial ordinance enforcement, I know this has a big price tag and we've seen the question a lot of, uh, you know, why does it cost so much? It costs as much as it does because we're assuming it's successful. There's a couple things happening. One is there are businesses who currently don't um, participate within the city system. They either don't have city collection service or they don't have waste management's franchise collection service. And the city knows that and they're working to try to get the um, properties to comply, but they haven't had the staff to be able to uh, get those properties into compliance, get the, you know, the other private hauler boxes off those properties, get them into the city system. Um, and in some cases, it's where uh, you know, more dense areas where businesses are able to use their neighbor's container and nobody is the wiser. Um, so there is both an increase in the number of customers that would be served and then an increase in the tonnage that we manage. And through the education and the outreach, driving more uh, businesses to actually participate in the recycling program, we're assuming that there would be an increase in the recycling. Um, that increase in recycling is going to come at a higher cost than the 
uh, trash. So if it's moving from trash to recycling, even though it's already in the system, there is an increased cost for that of over $100 per ton. Um, and that has to be reflected in those costs. That's where we get to um, the larger dollar value on this is uh, through that additional effort to serve those businesses, the outreach needed to get them in in the first place, and then the um, success of moving material from trash to recycling. And I think that's everything on this. What portion of that 1.6 million is the recycling? I knew you were going to ask that, Charlie. It would be roughly $140,000 if 4,000 bought a ton times 100. Roughly. But we also, and then we also assumed that there's an additional 4,000 tons that come into the system. So, uh, you know, another um, $100,000 there. So that's building up. It's about a third of the cost. Third of the cost. Uh, yep. Okay. And that's also, isn't it true that there's a portion of this commercial service that's paid for by the, by the Right. So a portion, a portion of this that, is this is the cost. A portion of that cost would be offset by revenue from those businesses that aren't currently participating that should be paying into the system. Um, and I know the question came up before about how uh, revenues balance um, with user fees and the millage. Um, this right, asked that yes. Um, so right now there's about a million, 1.2 million dollars of residential services that are paid for out of commercial generated revenues, if that makes sense. There's a, a, a bit of an imbalance um, on a 16.7 million dollar revenue base. And, and you covered that in the second session. That was in the, yep. And well, actually, I'll have a slide when we get to the conclusion on this, too, of okay. um, costs. So are you looking for the force So we can go ahead and do the force ranking on this as well. force ranking of these, and again, as John asked, if you don't prefer them at all, just leave them blank. We'll assume that that means no more. Okay, Christina, move on to the... Uh, all right, so moving on to the downtown. Here we really, you know, last month we had four different options. We stripped it down. Um, to two options primarily. And I think that it, as we took the feedback in, um, this is really a stepwise approach. First, let's start doing seven day collection. Um, that's something that the city uh, could be positioned to start providing more near term um, outside of any changes to overall service provision within the downtown. Um, and would provide some immediate benefits of you know more frequent collection for the restaurants. So that's the first option is the seven day collection. We've got the cost for providing that service. Um, the second and third uh, recommendations really to go together. So this would be coming in and doing a uh, wholesale inventory of all of the services downtown, uh, looking at the businesses that are contributing to those and developing a plan for how we can consolidate containers, try to get the carts out of the um, downtown as much as possible so we have fewer containers, provide more frequent service, and develop a cost allocation that would be based on that type of a special service district or special assessment type of a basis uh, to apportion those costs between those users. So that's uh, recommendations two and three. And then this fourth is the service consolidation uh, for the downtown sector. That would be taking all of the downtown properties, bringing them into one set of services, one service provider, uh, whether that would be the city or a contracted provider, and implementing the outcomes of recommendations two and three, and really tying all of those services to a nice, neat package. But we don't have enough information at this stage because of the other inventory and design work that needs to be done to be able to provide any cost information um, or further detail about how that looks until we would get further into that um, process if that's something that the city chooses to implement. So we can go ahead and we can rank these and you'll notice that two and three are combined on your sheet so really you've got three options um, for those rankings. Uh, we, one of the significant issues that was identified before this project started and that needed to be addressed through this plan was service improvements in the downtown, exclusive of diversion or m even married with diversion, but the objective being we need to provide the services in the most efficient manner that we can, and a limiter to the increase in diversion right now is the lack of space. So 
we learned through the organics plan that there was interest in doing um, organics diversion from restaurants downtown, but there is no space to place containers. So we need to remedy the space issue through higher levels of service. How do we do that? It's coming back to a redesign of what those container uh, situations look like and who's using them and how we fund that in order to be able to put the other pieces in place that come back to the commercial sector in general of the enforcement and participation um, and alignment with all of the ordinance requirements. And I would just add, I mean, not to be flippant, but kind of serious from my perspective, I don't want to be in another AmLive article about the downtown. I mean, quite frankly, it's that's a core piece of this is service improvement in the downtown. Well, it's also just an aesthetics issue, too. I mean, overflowing containers and things like that, I mean, which is not listed, which is not listed anywhere, but it's one of the reasons why expanded services is, is desirable, is that if you go down after a weekend or a special event downtown, it looks like, yep. Are there, are there any business, uh, business folks here that would like to speak to what we heard in the downtown focus group, which was very, very clear to improve the service in the downtown area. Anyone want to speak to that? Wait, hold on. I believe you were in that focus group. Right? I was, and it was unanimous that we all thought we had to do something for the downtown, and John made the comment correctly, and we met at our office to discuss the alleys, and um, I used the phrase that we have the uh, Everest of uh, garbage come uh, Sunday, and then it carries through Monday. A lot of the carts that we have in the downtown area take up a lot of horizontal space. And those carts are not picked up from Friday morning to Monday morning. That's 72 hours. And we're looking at the most critical time when restaurants and bars and cafes are operating. Not to say they're not busy other parts of the, the week, but that is their critical time. And it is when the majority of this garbage is collected and overflows. I've made this comment before in our, our focus group that when people come into Ann Arbor, they don't necessarily drive into Ann Arbor and randomly go to a neighborhood. Our neighborhoods are in pretty good shape, and I think we're thought of that way. They come downtown to shop, to entertain, to do di different things, and our impression, the impression we're giving people, is a negative one. And I think that unless we systemically handle this problem, we'll be continuously viewed that way. As a board member of the biz, the Business Improvement Zone, we established this zone, uh, this business area, eight years ago in order to have a systemic philosophy of removing snow, getting rid of postings, uh, getting rid of graffiti, planting uh, 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 flowers, planting trees, and so forth. And I would say that most building owners, of which I am, are independent thinking, but it is the only way that you can solve a major uh, community issue, to collect together and work together. So I'm hoping two things happen. We get rid of the carts, and that we uh, increase the frequency of collection, that is removal, and increase the size of the dumpsters. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Can we go through the, uh, we have education next? So this is a new one that we didn't have uh, to talk about last month and builds on, I think what we'd really like to all see is how can we get people to participate more in the programs we have because we do have first in class uh, programs that are available. We provide services to everyone um, on the residential side and um, you know, commercial has a lot of opportunity as well. So how can we get people to participate more and how can we incentivize people and motivate people to maybe produce less so that the number of containers that we have and the amount of collection that we have to do and the amount of uh, tonnage that gets managed through each of those different collection avenues is reduced. And that comes back to education and outreach. And We've looked at programs in peer communities. We've looked at what the city currently is doing. Um, Nancy has been kind enough to provide us a lot of information about what the city historically did um, and some context for that. And so based on all of that, we've got two primary recommendations around this. The first is to contract with a marketing and outreach firm to develop a marketing strategy, uh, branding, um, the messaging that would go along with a holistic outreach program for all of the city's solid waste related services. Uh, this could be tied to the outreach uh, contract that's already in place with um, Taxon communications for the utilities outreach uh, around the uh, water rates. Um, it could be tied to other sustainability messaging. There are a lot of ways that it could be 
brought together um, and serve multiple parts of city services in um, a way of being able to share cost and being able to share effort. So the cost that we have estimated in here is the cost to develop that strategy. There would still be additional costs that would come along with uh, certain portions of the implementation and rollout of that strategy depending on what would be developed, whether it's mailings or there's um, PSAs or billboard or bus wraps, things like that, um, that would all be provided as a menu within that um, package. And then the second piece is a grassroots outreach team. And this is something that the city has direct experience with through the work that um, Jan and Joe did on the More, Compo More Composting, More Carts program. Um, getting groups of volunteers together, going out and doing door knocking, talking to residents, trying to drive behavior and participation in a program that existed. Um, they were grant funded and they did a, a great job of documenting and analyzing their results, but they had a narrow window that they worked within. And the work on this type of outreach really requires time to be able to uh, take hold with people, get behaviors to change, and see uh, long-term impacts through increased participation, increased diversion, higher quality of participation, um, which their uh, funding didn't allow them to be able to do. Um, but they set the pieces in place, and I think it's a model for how uh, that could be effective for other services within the city. Um, Interestingly enough, one of the questions we were asked, I think it was at the Environmental Commission, um, when we first started this project was, how does San Francisco get to a 70% or an 80% diversion rate? Their outreach program looks basically like this. Um, they, have a, they have an outreach team that is a grassroots outreach team that spends time both going to businesses and to um, residents, doing the door knocking, working in the neighborhoods, working with community groups, and uh, they focus on people that have, their leaders are people who are um, experienced in community-based social marketing. Uh, they have marketing backgrounds, so not necessarily within the context area of solid waste, but who have a passion for the, the work. Um, and then they work to coordinate the teams that go out and do that work. And they started originally with a lot of volunteers. They also had um, stimulus funding back when they first started the program. Uh, so they had a team of 50 people that were doing this. They're down now, they have 11 um, staff, but they're public works trainees. They work on a two year assignment, kind of as a uh, higher level intern, if you will, um, to get exposure. And they do that through multiple city departments um, with some of them focused to solid waste, but some focused to other sustainability areas. So that's a model that I think that the city can embrace here um, Seattle has also been doing something very similar with their outreach. And again, they're one of those that we see as a high diversion community. Both of those communities do say part of the reason they get to the high diversion is because they have a requirement in place. They're mandatory uh, diversion for their businesses and for their residents for recycling and for organics. But they didn't start there. They started with the outreach first to try to build the message, try to incentivize um, the behavior change, and give that time to work. So. Um, that's where we've really uh, taken these two recommendations. Um, I, on this basis, uh, we're asking you to rank them. Uh, the challenges, I think they really go hand in hand. So is it necessary to rank them? I don't think it is. Yeah, I, I think we. <laughs> I, think it's, I think it's maybe it's a yes or a no. <laughs> yes. I just wanted to ask if these are intended as add ons to the programs that the city has currently that it does. That, that it does with its staff and that it does under contract, or, or if they're meant as replacements. No, I think that as part of the um, work of the mar marketing and advertising firm, those existing efforts would be brought in as um, you know, part of what is being done now, evaluated for how it could be improved or changed, whether it's, you know, or maybe just continue operating as is. Um, at this point until somebody who has that background, that community-based social marketing um, experience would come in and look at it. We, we see those types of programs that the city does now in place in most communities. Um, but those are really, um, you know, I don't see those going away. I guess that's a short answer. Um, I see those being a part of the strategy. Um, but once that strategy would be developed, then it's up to, you know, figuring out on that menu of options which elements get implemented. Um, but building upon that. One of the challenges that the city has now is with having a smaller staff, they don't have the ability to do as much of the face-to-face -face outreach, which is really where it's more beneficial. Um, to get people to change behavior, because that's really what we're looking for is behavior change. Um, if you can get people how they can, if you get people interested to be able to go look for the information, the information is there for them. But we have to try to drive that interest first. 
I'll, I'll just I'll just know a lot of people here are aware of this, but th this is a, a a version of what the city did when Nancy Na Nancy was was there 25 30 years ago, uh, l large largely through uh, the Ecology Center in Recycle Ann Arbor. Yeah, I think there's been a lot of support, Mike, for bringing back that type of focus to the education and outreach, and it's been a matter of the resources haven't been available. So that's are, are, are we through with the prioritization? I believe we are. Okay, if you could collect the forms from that uh, side. Yeah, the one last thing that we did have on the form is we wanted you to identify your two highest priority items oh. out of all of the different if areas. If you could do that real quick. Um, so that, you know, not just Your two highest, one. if you could yep. select the two that you want the city to focus on above all else. Okay, um, while she's picking that up, John, I saw your hand up. You had a comment? Okay. Jim, you had a comment? I'm going to give you this. Yeah, I want to build on Mike's uh, point about uh, many, many years ago, we had a city plan that was developed and it recommended three staff people to run an expanded program. And in fact, I think all three of those staff people are here uh, in retired form. And, and in fact, for the next couple decades, they ran with it and made it all happen. Um, so in, in sort of bringing it into context, in your, both your summary of the top four priorities, you mentioned a little bit about staffing, and then you also, throughout the document, have various additional positions. And so something that would be useful is some kind of expression of that from an org chart or a functional plan altogether because that was a big part of the original decision many years ago to say, if we're going to do this, this is how we'll do it, this is the team that's going to carry it out. And I think you have this similar sort of foundation of it right here. So. Okay, uh, one of the questions that came up Sorry. and has come up multiple times. Did you want me to go through this real quick before we... Move yeah, on. please. Sorry. Uh, so just real quick, I know you know we had a lot of options in there. One of the things that we put together is a direct cost impact calculation if everything was to be implemented, um, and what kind of metric goes along with that. Um, so in total, it's about $3 million a year to implement all the recommendations with the exception of the downtown container consolidation and service consolidation in the downtown because we don't know enough about how that will look yet. Um, that breaks out about $500,000 of that cost is on residential and outreach and education pieces. And I rolled the outreach and education into the residential because that's a significant portion of where it will um, be absorbed or be focused. Um, and then on commercial and seven day downtown collection, that's about two and a half million dollars per year. So for residential, if we look at the existing revenue split um, and I think I mentioned before, there's about a $1.2 million additional uh, commercial generated revenue that helps to support residential programs. Um, this $500,000 works out to $1.60 per household per month. If we were to balance those revenues and expenses between sectors, get away from that imbalance, the overall impact on residential costs is about $5.50 a household a month for all of these different options within the residential sector and the outreach program. On the commercial side, it's an increase of $150, $150 per customer per month to do all of these things. What that doesn't reflect, though, is the number of those businesses that aren't already paying into the system. They would help to offset a portion of that. Um, and if the uh, revenues and expenses were balanced between the sectors, it's an increase of $80 per customer per month. Um, but again, that's going to get the uh, compost collection program for the restaurants, which probably would be used by only a subset of uh, the, the businesses and therefore is going to be paid for by those. So this is a very generalized metric just to gauge what those overall cost impacts are. Okay. Well, my new best friend, Theo Egerman, is up here to talk about Warma. So if you could give us a five minute elevator speech on that, I'd appreciate it. We might keep it even a minute or two shorter. Okay. Um, so the county has been leading the uh, regionalization efforts um, so we've facilitated the process 
and I just want to give people an update since it sounds like there's a lot of questions. Um, so we facilitated the process. We got people together based on um, common issues that people were having that could have a regional solution. Um, so we're in the process of forming. Uh, we have seven, seven members who've signed on. Um, we're looking to get the city on board. That's up to city council. Um, there's three tiers of service that members who have decided to join the authority have talked about creating or um, addressing. The first was education and outreach. The second was drop-off stations. We have a need for both full service drop-off stations, but also the lesser drop-off stations where there's not an attendant there all the time where you can drop off your common recyclables. Um, and then the last issue was a, a MRF. Um, so those are all things that people gathered around and said, yes, these are issues that we want to talk about, that we want to collaboratively look to a regional solution. Um, some of the caveats of that is the authority did not want to own and operate a MRF themselves. They want to have a public partnership or public-private partnership uh, to address that solution. No one was really interested in owning that um, facility. Um, it's up to the members to address what they want to tackle. And they said, we're new, we're forming, we want to start with education and outreach. So we want to get our recyclables to be something that are of value so that we can sell them on the market. We don't want to have a bunch of contaminated recycling that we send off for someone else to deal with. We want to get it to be a clean stream and then work on the MRF portion. Um, so that's where they were at when we formed. The last uh, meeting that we had was in November when we were discussing those issues. So it'll be up to the, the group to decide where those, um, where they want to progress first. So if you want to talk with me afterwards, I'm happy to address questions or anything that you have curiosities about for Warma. Has the first meeting occurred yet of the members? We haven't. We've asked for delegates from the communities who've signed on and we're, we're looking to meet. We haven't sent in our paperwork uh, because we want to allow the city of Ann Arbor to, to join. Christina, anything to add? Okay. Um, I'm going to ask Crescen to talk about how the remaining activities will occur and the timing. Well, we had something in mind, but things may, may change. Um, so, but at minimum, it will certainly uh, be included in the process. Touched on it earlier, a uh, couple of different points um, that uh, Aptum, as well as staff, our, our team, is going to be uh, pulling together all these materials, looking at the detail and the, the uh, uh, projections to develop those final recommendations and put together a final draft report. We've got up here that report is going to be shared and brought to the Environmental Commission. We're going to be having a discussion with them. They're basically the sponsor, the owner of this, that, that uh, we want them, obviously, to, to weigh in on that. But we are also going to be sharing that draft report, and again, as was mentioned, with all of you. Give you that opportunity to review it, comment, provide your feedback. One thing now with the outcome here, and back to Charlie looking for timing, we'll have to see uh, how that shakes out. I'm going to be taking back the feedback, what Charlie, Christina, and I have heard here. Take that back to uh, my administration and see if, and look at the consultant team as to what would it take to uh, add in another another meeting, uh, what would the timing be, and how do we fit that in through this process? I would anticipate it, but I haven't consulted with my team fully here either, but uh, look to have that along with and closely timed with the draft report so that things get more refined and things come together, but we'd have to lay that out. Uh, Heather, right on top of it, uh, went and talked with uh, Kelly at the front desk, and so the uh, th last three Tuesdays in June are available for this room. So if we do have another meeting, if you want to pencil in tentatively on your calendar, uh, the 11th, 18th, or 25th are all available. So we're, we'll work with the DDA and Kelly to try to block those off so we have at least got the same meeting room, same time, same bat station. Um, but uh, I will need to take that back and see if we can add that uh, item to the scope of the contract. Uh, but those, those key items definitely want to, that are there and will still be there, is sharing with you folks that draft report, getting you that opportunity to review, comment, provide feedback, and uh, targeting the July 25th Environmental Commission meeting uh, for uh, working with the commission 
uh, on that, that report as well. And Chris, I just wanted to make it clear that what I heard from the group is if, if there is a fifth meeting, we want to make sure that we're addressing these topics. And what I would ask you to do is we will send you a meeting summary. If there's other topics that are must, if you're going to do another meeting, please put the, you know, headline these. Let us know. Okay? Yep. Right? Absolutely. You yep. agree? Correct. Absolutely. Okay. We want to make sure that we've got it uh, buttoned up. Right. Okay. Uh, thank you, Cresson. With that in mind, I've just distributed our public engagement feedback form. If you could fill that out and give us some feedback about how we're doing as a team to communicate and interact with you, uh, I would appreciate it. Just one other informal plug I forgot at the beginning, but there's still plenty of cookies. Only a couple of people even knew. I didn't point that out early, so lighten my load on the way back. Though the DDA and fourth floor city hall staff always enjoy these meetings, but you can help me make it uh, lighten my load on the way back, so help yourself on the way out. Okay, Chris, and any closing words? I will collect the forms. Yeah, yeah and... This may not be our last meeting, but uh, I still, again, want to thank you all for your continued participation, your efforts, your feedback. Uh, we know there's a lot of uh, passion around the topic, a lot of concerns, a lot of issues and things, and we're all looking to improve and, and move us uh, going forward. And uh, you folks continue to make this a, a more valuable product in the end and, uh, and experience, and I hope you're uh, appreciative of your efforts because uh, we certainly are and want to thank you again for that so um, stay tuned and again thanks for coming and, and helping us out and I guess I'll I don't know if leave it to Charlie public comment if, if now or give it a little time for people to finish forms but I'll turn it over to you to close um. I'm assuming we don't have any public comment, but I would sure like to hear, we have a few minutes, if any of the advisory committee members have any comments about the process that they would like to share. Um, I do want to thank Crescent and Christina for willing to consider and hopefully respond to some of the issues that were raised today. John? I want to basically uh, applaud the process. I think we have a much better understanding of uh, information about solid waste than we had before. If I look at some of the figures that we had before on diversion rates and how inaccurate they were, on financial figures and how inaccurate they were, they're cer certainly much better. Um, if I look at how I fill this out, um, I've invested a tremendous amount of time in this, probably a couple hundred hours over the last several months, um, just in general, not just in this, but I feel like all of the public engagement was good other than the advisory committee meetings and those all seemed rushed to me. So what we're, we're, you know, all the culmination of this should have been in these meetings and I always felt that we really didn't have enough time to hash things out and get to really fundamental common understandings about the financial figures, about diversion rates, about relative costs, all these different kinds of things just because we tried to cram it into two hours Appreciate that feedback. Thank you. Yeah, I think the um, echo one point about, uh, well, both about the process and all its benefits, um, but also that it's a pretty heady audience here. And I think you could have thrown a complex spreadsheet at us and we would have been like, uh, as they say, pigs in blank. Um, and we didn't get it, so we're frustrated because that's how a lot of decision making is done by, I'm gonna say 95% of the people in this room. So. Um, just pass that on to the team. Thanks, Jim. Well, here's a friendly suggestion towards the final report, if people thought this was a good idea, is to have an appendix that would be uh, include comments that people may want to put into the formal report, uh, but as an appendix, so people would have an opportunity to, to respond or add additional topics that they feel uh, they have some expertise to add to, and didn't fit within the original focus of the, of the contract. And um, that could be published separately. That's often done with these kind of plans. And I would only ask if this idea was successfully entertained, 
that in the intro to or the table of contents of the official report, there would also say appendix is available so that it's not just lost. That it's not just an exercise we feel good about that we had comments put in. Can I respond to that real quick? Um, I just wanted to note that the meeting summaries will all be included in the appendix as well as these feedback forms that will certainly be included as I think that that's for sure, right? In addition, it's standard practice, at least in the plans that I've been involved in, that any public comment that is provided, which is kind of how I'm envisioning what you're talking about, um, a written comment um, that is provided to the draft plan would be incorporated in an appendix, and that would be set up as part of the intended structure of the document. So like, is there a way to just assemble that came through? We would, I, I, we would ask that if you have something that you wish to submit, that when that draft plan is is put out that it be sent in and we'll provide a process for that so it's clear so that we know what uh, those authors of those different documents want to have included. Because we did receive quite a, f a little bit of input throughout the process and it would be re really great to know exactly what you would like to have surfaced in the report versus for our information. Any other comments? Hi. On behalf of the Apartment Association, I just want to say thank you for picking up the trash this move out uh, weekend. It, the city looked awesome. Uh, I don't. I have photos of what it looked like last year, and um, it's, it'd be pedantic to pass those around to you guys. You know what an overflowing dumpster looks like, um, and when there's stuff put in front of the dumpster, so that the, the, when the trucks do come, they can't even get to them. Uh, the city also has raccoons, and <laughs> in the middle of the night, they come out and they drag it all over the rest of the city. So um, we're looking forward to having a great move in, uh, a great move in and move out weekend coming this fall, and moving forward and doing the same thing. And we're really excited about it. Um, the gentleman, I believe he left, but um, when he was saying the city, it needs to look good, especially on these really important weekends when. People are in town, and it's, you know, this is, we're representing ourselves, and we can't have overflowing dumpsters everywhere. So, um, also, the idea of having individuals pay for an extra service tip, um, that would be great if that worked. We'd love to just throw $80 at the problem and have it <laughs> over, <laughs> over and done with. Um, but, our members were telling us, oh, we did that, and then guess what? There's an empty dumpster, and then it gets filled 10 minutes later by people trespassing. Um, they see, oh, there's an empty dumpster, so I'm going to walk down the street and, and use it. And um, we don't want to, uh, the number it looked like it was $50,000. We don't want the city to have to spend more than that um, in the police, like dealing with the people are going to start calling the police if there's people trespassing <laughs> and people don't want shouldn't have to stand outside their dumpster and guard it for 48 hours <laughs> to make sure people aren't aren't illegally using it so <laughs> yeah so um yeah, we could go on and on, but like people have said, there's a lot of good things to talk about, and so thank you for your time, and thank you for picking up the trash. We appreciate it. Well, that's a nice positive note to end on. Thank you very much for all of your cooperation, your input. I really appreciate it. These have been very productive meetings. I apologize for the feeling of being rushed. Um, this is a, you know, this is a very, very diverse topic and quite a passionate group, and I really have enjoyed working with all of you. Take care, everybody. Have a great weekend.